evening and welcome to our webinar on international trade in a post-Brexit world. My name is Catherine Atkinson, I'm the Secretary of the Society of Labour Lawyers and we also have with us this evening members of the Labour Movement for Europe. We have four expert speakers, we have Richard Corbett, the former MEP and Labour Group leader in the European Parliament. We have Alfred Astley, barrister at Moncton Chambers. We have Daniel Jones, International Trade Associate at DLA Piper. And we have Jill Barrett, the barrister at Six Pump Court. Now, each speaker will have about five minutes uh, and then we will open it up to discussion. And if you do have a question or contribution that you want to make, please put your hand up so that we can switch on your video and microphone. But we'll take the speakers in the order that I introduce them. So if we can start with Richard Corbett. I think you're still on mute, so I'll just try and make sure that. Yeah, okay. okay. Hello, and um, thank you. And um, lovely to be here. Yeah, we are, as I'm sure you all know, currently in the post-Brexit transition period. During that period, all rights and obligations of EU membership and all EU legislation stay in place as regards the UK. The only thing that has changed is that we are no longer represented in the institutions that take decisions. But otherwise, it is the status quo. At the end of that period, if there is no agreement on what to replace it with on the future relationship, then overnight, all current EU legal arrangements, programmes um, and agreements that we have cease overnight to exist without being replaced. That is why the transition period is supposed to be used to negotiate replacement agreements of one kind or another on the future uh, to replace what we have at present. If that is not done by the end of the transition period, we have the, this so-called cliff edge, famous cliff edge. At the moment, though, those negotiations are in crisis. They are in crisis really on, on many issues, but two are outstanding. One on the economic front, the UK government does not wish to commit to a so-called level playing field. In other words, the UK wants access to the single European market as now without customs barriers, trade restrictions or quantitative restrictions, but without playing by the same rules. It wants to be able to diverge on the regulatory standards, on consumer protection, environmental standards, workplace rights, competition law, state aid law, and so on, which currently ensure that that market has a level playing field. The EU says, no, if you want access to our market, you have to play by the same rules, or at least observe similar standards. Second area, similar though, is that the UK wants to maintain access on the police and security and judicial cooperation front to the Europol, the police databases that there are, the Schengen information system, uh, the European arrest warrant, without committing to the safeguards that go with that, namely, a number of them, but most symbolically important, even the commitments that the UK will remain a member of the European Convention on Human Rights. The EU is saying if you don't wish to commit to uphold the safeguards, then you can't have access to, the, um, to those databases and so on. I'm simplifying some rather complex issues here, but that is the state of play in those negotiations. There are other issues to do with governance, whether you want a single agreement or multiple agreements, and, and fishing and a whole range of other things but for me those two are outstanding now on the eu side they feel particularly strongly about this they say hang on a minute we agreed with the withdrawal agreement a political declaration where both sides set out the basis for the future relationship and that political declaration included the words 
that uh, both sides agree to develop an ambitious, wide-ranging, balanced economic partnership underpinned by provisions ensuring a level playing field for open and fair competition. And indeed that that should cover, and I'm quoting, state aid, competition, social and environmental standards, climate change, and relevant tax matters. They're saying that's what we both agreed to do. So if you're backing out of it, that, that is, uh, um, something that we find rather unacceptable, should we say, to put it politely. That's why the negotiations are at crisis point. Now, the transition period comes to an end at the end of this year. However, there is a provision in the withdrawal agreement that would enable it to be extended by either one or two years through a single decision that has to be taken under the withdrawal agreement by the end of next month. So we are weeks away from uh, the point where a decision has to be taken for extension. The government is quite adamant, the UK government, that it does not wish to seek such an extension. The EU has signaled that it is willing to have an extension. For one thing, the original timetable for the negotiations has been um, buggered up, excuse my French, by the COVID epidemic. Um, both Michel Barnier and his British counterparts have, have been victims to that. Meetings are only taking place by in the same way that we're having our discussion now by tele-meeting. So the negotiations, even in the, with the best will in the world and the best circumstances, would be finding it difficult to settle such a wider range of issues um, by the end of this year and have the agreement ratified. And remember, if the agreement is a wide-ranging one, then such ratification is not just a matter on the EU side for the European Parliament. If it's a wide ranging agreement, it becomes a mixed agreement in the jargon, needing ratification by every national parliament of all 27 EU member states. And in the case of Belgium, it's regional parliaments as well. And I remind you that the Wallonia parliament um, expressed strong reservations even for the CETA agreement. So, you need some time for that. And the idea that it could be wrapped up by the end of the year is, is, is really seen by most observers to be rather, rather ambitious, shall, I, shall we say. So there'll be a lot of pressure in the next few weeks to say this, there's already pressure in, within the UK as well, to say this deadline has to be extended. The government's being unreasonable in saying it shouldn't be. In other way, that's guaranteeing that we move to the cliff edge. However, there are elements in the Conservative Party who are quite happy to leave without any deal. They know there will be a huge economic hit and other disadvantages, but after all, the very reason they wanted Brexit in the first place for some of them was to escape from European rules and regulations and escape from the high standards that apply in the a single European market on consumer protection, environmental protections, workplace rights, and so on. They want an economic free-for-all. They want Britain to be aligned with the USA rather than with Europe in, in many ways. And they are quite happy, as it were, to take the economic hit um, to achieve that. And they think the economic consequences of Brexit can be hidden away with the underneath the economic consequences of the COVID lockdown. People won't notice it so much and you can blame it all on the coronavirus and not on the failure of the negotiations. So we're actually reaching a potentially rather dramatic um, situation over the next few weeks. I, I could say a lot more but I'd better leave it there. Thank you. Thank you very much. So we will move on to Alfred Astley. Uh, Alfred Artley. Actually. Oh, I'm so sorry. No Alfred worries. Artley, thank you for correcting. Uh, do apologize. Uh, so I'm going to be talking a bit about the Northern Irish Protocol. Uh, which we all cast our minds back to the end of last year. Everyone spent a lot of time worrying about the Northern Irish backstop. And the Conservative government came back with this rabbit out of a hat called the Northern Irish Protocol but I'm going to suggest that it could actually turn out to be more of a millstone around the neck of the government than a rabbit out of the hat going forward. 
So, firstly, in terms of customs, briefly, the drafting of the customs section is not particularly clear, but it's pretty obvious once you start pulling it apart and working out what it really says, that you can't possibly do away without having substantial checks at Irish ports. And that's something the government's latest command, command paper does now acknowledge. In fact, those of you who remember Brexino, Brexit in name only, I think we could call the customs elements of the Northern Ireland Protocol more like Inuktino, which is that it's going to be Northern Ireland in the UK customs area, customs territory in name only, because effectively the Nor Northern Irish area is going to end up staying inside the EU area for customs purposes. But more significantly, and probably perhaps going to be a, a greater political hot potato going forward will be the state aid aspects of the Northern Irish Protocol. And really one has to wonder, once one actually understands what, how the protocol operates, whether the government fully appreciated what it was signing up to. Now, state aid is buried in Article 10.1 of the, of the protocol, which is headed state aid, and then goes on to say, the provisions of union law listed in Annex 5 to this protocol shall apply to the union, including with regard to measures supporting the production of and trade in agricultural products in Northern Ireland, in respect to measures which affect that trade between Northern Ireland and the union which is subject to this protocol, which isn't the easiest thing to understand. So what does this actually mean? Well, I'll make three, three observations about it. First, the provisions of union law listed in Annex 5 is union state aid law. That's Articles 107 to 9, general sectoral block exemptions, and all the associated commission guidance. Second, perhaps the most important point, is the effect of this drafting is that the rules, these EU rules, do not apply only to Northern Ireland, rather, they apply to the entire UK insofar as any UK measure might affect trade between Northern Ireland and the EU. And this is very important because it means that it's not just Northern Irish devolved administrations acts, but all UK measures which will be caught by this as long as they pass the effect on trade hurdle. Well, that hurdle, as we know, is a very low threshold when the Commission is making decisions on on state aid, it tend, tends to be often a couple of lines of generic reasoning or you know, virtually no economic analysis at all often. So in principle, almost any UK measure might be said to affect trade between Northern Ireland and the EU. Thirdly, although it's only goods which technically subject to the, or goods trade, which is technically subject to the protocol, if there were state, a state aid which benefited services which could affect the goods trade, for example, road haulage, obvious, obvious case, that would also be caught too. Now, taxes is going to be one area where this will be particularly sensitive. And from the customs side, these could al also be caught by Article 110 on discriminatory taxation, which would also be preserved by the protocol. But on the subsidy side, this, this could be significant even if there's a subsidy for an industry which isn't, it doesn't even exist in Northern Ireland. So if, for example, a subsidy was only to Scottish producers, but the goods in the end would be exported to Northern Ireland, that would place Northern Irish industries at a competitive advantage. So Harris Tweed, for example, if the Harris Tweed, made, only made in Scotland, was then exported to Northern Ireland, then that, and used in Northern Irish clothes manufacturing, which was then going to be produced, of which was then going to be exported into the EU across the Irish border, then that would count. Also, enforcement, probably going to be another flashpoint. One might expect that the state aid provisions would have been enforced by the Joint Committee of EU and UK representatives that the withdrawal agreement sets up. But no, it's actually the Commission which is responsible for enforcement and the Court of Justice retains its ultimate oversight. 
Now, it goes without saying, it's going to be pretty unpalatable if the UK government has to ask the Commission's permission before it is able to go and introduce some new tax measure. So, where are we going with this in terms of future negotiations? Well, currently, two sides are diametrically opposed. Tories, at uh, the last election, promised a WTO-based anti-subsidy regime, which they claimed would offer greater governmental discretion and certainty to investors. And that's now reflected in their latest command paper on the government's negotiating position. The EU, by contrast, envisages union state aid rules continuing to apply in the UK, but with an independent UK authority to enforce them in cooperation with the Commission, but the Court of Justice staying as the final arbiter. However, I'd suggest, what is the, really the point of the UK having a different regime if, because of the Northern Ireland Protocol, it has to follow the EU rules anyway, if anything, anything that potentially affects the Northern Ireland EU trade? Surely two layers of bureaucracy is going to, or two and two layers of approval is going to lead to more complexity, not less. And also, what do we hope to gain from a new WTO style regime anyway. We're not going to get greater legal certainty because there's very little WTO case law. In any event, subsidies in the WTO definition end up being much the same as they are in EU law. The real difference would be in enforcement, which is that enforcement in EU terms is done by a supranational body, the Commission, rather than state to state. But there's a question about whether the, whether the UK would really like that so much to have only at an interstate level, because having a strong subsidy enforcement regime, in fact, stops the devolved administrations spending large amounts of money and granting state aid in that way. So, not a very satisfactory position for the UK to end up. Will it try and renegotiate? Well, I wish it luck. Thank you very much, Alfred Artley. We will now have Daniel Jones. Thanks, Catherine. Uh, so we've heard from Richard and Alfred about the impact on trade within the UK and between the UK and EU 27. Uh, I'll use my time to cover the UK's post-Brexit trade with the rest of the world. So, so broadly speaking, the government has three sets of trade priorities beyond securing a deal with the EU. The first is its so-called continuity negotiations program. So that's its efforts to roll over current EU agreements so that the UK continues to benefit from them after the end of the transition period. The second is its future agreements program. That's its attempts to negotiate new FTAs where the EU does not have an equivalent agreement. I think the United States, but also Australia, New Zealand and others. Lastly, the UK needs to establish its framework for trade with third countries it won't have an agreement with by the end of the transition period. They're the countries that it will trade with on what are referred to as WTO terms. Given the limited amount of time, I'll focus on the, the first of these, the government's attempts and progress to date on rolling over or replicating agreements between the EU and third countries. So what's the government trying to do? It's easy to forget now, but one of the central pillars of the Leave campaign was the promise that Global Britain would have a long queue of willing partners keen to strike new trade deals, creating business, investment opportunities and jobs. Lost in that narrative, I think, is that job number one was effectively a defensive one. It was preventing the UK from losing the benefits of 41 trade agreements that the EU has, which currently govern the UK's relationship with 72 countries. During the transition period, the UK is committed to complying with those agreements in the withdrawal agreement, i.e. will continue to grant preferential access to those 72 partner countries. In turn, those 72 countries have voluntarily, no, not legally, but voluntarily, agreed to provide equivalent preferential access to the UK. But after the 31st of December, the end of the transition period, EU trade agreements won't apply to the UK. So the government needs to produce the effect of existing EU agreements as closely as possible to prevent a cliff edge for business. 
where the government fails to agree a rolled over agreement, trade between the UK and that third country will revert to WTO terms. So how's the government doing so far? Uh, with what you might call his usual uh, unfounded self-confidence. In 2017, then Secretary of State Liam Fox assured anyone who would listen that all 41 agreements would be ready one second after midnight in March 2019. In reality, the government as of today has signed 20 of those agreements covering 48 countries. That includes Chile, Israel, Morocco, South Korea and others. Not bad, you might say, but it's important to note that the agreements the UK has signed are not completely identical to the equivalent EU agreements. By way of example, the UK and Switzerland have only been able to agree on the continu continuation of a minority of the mutual recognition agreements in place between the EU and Switzerland. Why is that? Well, because Switzerland maintains legislative equivalents with the EU in a number of areas and therefore could not commit to mutual recognition of UK practices in those areas unless the UK too conforms to EU standards. So the UK's future relationship with Switzerland won't be known until the UK's relationship with the EU is settled. And similar issues arise with respect to Iceland, Norway uh, and indeed Turkey. And what of the 20 agreements that the government has not rolled over? Some of these are potentially significant gaps the UK could be left without an agreement in place come the end of the transition period with Canada, Mexico, Japan, Singapore and Egypt. The challenges are in part clearly capacity and bandwidth. The government's having to work on these discussions alongside its negotiations with the EU, as well as the recently launched negotiations with the US, Australia, New Zealand and others. However, there are other issues beyond capacity, which I think tell us something interesting about the reality of the UK's post-Brexit negotiating position. These trading partners who will not simply roll over EU agreements want either better terms from the UK than they were willing to agree with the EU, or as with the case of Canada, they won't agree to their own future relationship with the UK until they know what the relationship is going to look like between the EU and UK. Japan's a really interesting example, and in lots of ways, the Japanese government has negotiating objectives, which uh, some of which are quite similar to the priorities of the United States. The Japanese want the UK to drop current EU food import restrictions imposed after the Fukushima nuclear disaster. So currently, the EU insists on inspections and certificates of origin for Japanese produce, including seafood. The Japanese government will ask the UK to drop these import restrictions as part of any negotiations. Secondly, the Japanese want the immediate and complete tariff elimination uh, in, in the import of cars uh, and also automotive parts. Lastly, Japan wants a more liberal digital trade regulation than it currently has with the EU. While that might be of benefit to certain UK businesses, the risks associated with data protection clearly require careful thought. So why should we care then? In, in addition to the clear risk for businesses of uh, what Richard called a cliff edge with respect to UK trade with those third countries, I also think the challenges that the government's faced in rolling over certain of these agreements are reflective of wider challenges that the UK may face in negotiating with other third countries. Firstly, expectation management. The government's over-promised and under-delivered. Over-promised in terms of its capacity to manage a large number of competing negotiations, and also over-promised on the substance of those agreements that it has managed to replicate. Secondly, the government's come up against the challenge repeatedly that its ability to negotiate trade agreements with third countries is intimately connected with the progress of its negotiations with the EU. Thirdly, the negotiations indicate the strain that will be placed on the red lines the government supposedly set, it reassures us, in terms of protecting environmental standards, animal welfare and public services. Will the government be willing to trade off those interests for the political capital that will come from achieving a deal? We've heard a lot about chlorinated chicken, but in the case of Japan, think about nuclear crab sticks and, and you get the idea. Lastly, as I think Jill's going to go on to cover, 
the trade bill, which establishes the domestic legal framework for the rolled over agreements, is telling because it gives us an indication of the extremely limited oversight and scrutiny that the government intends its trade negotiations to be subject to. And I think that's something that should concern us all. Thank you very much, Dan. Before we move on to Jill, if I could just remind you, if you have a question or contribution, please put your hand up so we'll be able to switch your video on. And please try and make sure your questions relate to the top of our webinar, International Trade. Jill. Thank you. Well, I'd like to talk about how Parliament should be involved in scrutinising future trade agreements with um, new partners, so uh, those other than the EU. I shall try to cover five points. Uh, one, Parliament's legal role in treaty making. Two, why this is inadequate. Three, why this matters, especially for trade treaties. Four, what the government is doing about it. And five, what Parliament is or, or should be doing about it. So one, uh, what is Parliament's role in relation to the making of treaties? Treaties are negotiated, signed and ratified by the government using royal prerogative powers. In law, Parliament has two distinct roles. One is under the Constitutional Reform and Governance Act 2010, CRAG. The government must lay a new treaty before Parliament for 21 sitting days after signature but prior to ratification. In theory, this gives Parliament the opportunity to scrutinise the treaty and object to ratification. An objection by the Commons would legally block the ratification. Secondly, Parliament has a role in the legislative process if there is essential implementing legislation because Parliament, if it blocked it, um, this would normally stop the government from ratifying the treaty. So my second point, uh, why Parliament's role is inadequate. Parliamentary scrutiny of treaties is woefully inadequate, partly because its powers are limited, but partly because Parliament doesn't make effective use of the powers that it already has. The Commons has never used its power under CRAG to veto the ratification of a treaty. The main deficiencies are um, CRAG scrutiny is too late for Parliament to influence ongoing treaty negotiations. There is no mechanism under CRAG to ensure that a debate and a vote can take place if requested by um, backbenchers or by scrutiny, um, sorry, select committees. Uh, the government controls the parliamentary timetable. And three, Parliament hasn't organised itself to scrutinise treaties effectively. Um, so my third uh, theme is why is this especially important for trade treaties? Um, well, this is for several reasons. Trade treaties directly affect businesses and the public to a much greater degree than many other treaties. Trade treaties can take various forms, for example, free trade agreements, or you can have trade provisions contained within association or cooperation agreements that cover other subjects, such as security, immigration, human rights, environmental or labor standards. So these concern a range of select committees, not just those that scrutinize trade. And therefore, central coordination of parliamentary scrutiny across committees is essential. The UK has not negotiated its own trade treaties for 50 years, and so the risks of poor outcomes are high. Early and proactive engagement by Parliament in interrogating the government's approach could strengthen the government's position in negotiations and help it to achieve outcomes that would be acceptable or more acceptable not only to Parliament but also to the wider public. Fourth point then, what is the government doing about it? Well, the Theresa May administration made some important concessions to Parliament in relation to future trade treaties with new partners in a command paper of February 2019 on transparency. Uh, they made non-statutory commitments to specific forms of transparency at three stages, prior to treaty negotiations, during the negotiations, and at the end of the negotiations. 
The problem is that Johnson's administration has not reiterated these commitments and it's not known whether they intend to abide by them or not. So far, um, they seem to have acted consistently with the first part um, before the negotiations. Um, an outline approach and public consultations have taken place in relation to several USA um, is one, and I think Japan um, is another. But there's no commitment to publish round reports and the signs so far are not promising. So fifthly then, what is Parliament doing about it? Well, the House of Lords committees have shown more interest in scrutinising treaties than the Commons. Since January 2019, the House of Lords EU committee has been undertaking scrutiny of Brexit related treaties, um, particularly the rollover treaties that Daniel just talked about. And I believe they're doing a useful job in pointing out some of the issues in those treaties. For example, um, powers to amend treaties in a way that would not even attract Crag scrutiny in the future. The House of Lords has just set up a new international agreement subcommittee chaired by Lord Goldsmith. And that committee has just launched an inquiry into how Parliament scrutinises treaties, including the negotiation of new trade agreements. And I think this is a really positive development. The problem is there's no equivalent treaty committee in the House of Commons. And this is, if anything, more important as the Commons has a veto power under CRAG, which the Lords doesn't. The Commons International Trade Committee does, of course, consider trade negotiations, but its main focus tends to be on the policy and the legislation, but not on the treaty texts themselves. So I think the House of Commons needs to set up a treaty committee or designate an existing committee to take on this role, to work in cooperation with all the select committees across the House and to coordinate with the new Lords Treaty Committee. Ideally, at some point, a joint committee of both houses might be formed, although this doesn't seem to be uh, practical at the present moment. Um, the House of Commons uh, Treaty Committee needs to set new standards for the provision of information about treaties under negotiation and um, provide opportunities for Parliament to consider the government's negotiating aims and priorities it should be given the power to call for a debate and a vote under CRAG. It should demand from government a commitment to extend the CRAG scrutiny period to allow for input from uh, committee inquiries and public engagement um, on the future trade treaties, which will obviously attract a lot of public interest and concerns. Um, and finally, a treaty committee could provide a useful focal point for dialogue with the devolved legislatures about trade treaties and also with other stakeholders. Thank you very much, Jill. We will come on to our questions and contributions and if everyone can keep it um, short, then we'll be able to get lots more in. So we'll start with George Peretz. George. Yeah, um, the question I was going to, really point I was going to make is that um, if one's looking at what the EU is actually proposing in terms of the state aid rules, it seems to me that there's something of a trap for the Labour Party in supporting that. What the EU is actually proposing is that the UK remain part of the, remain entirely subject to the jurisdiction of the Court of Justice on which we will, we no longer have any judges and effectively to the jurisdiction of the European Commission and subject to EU state aid rules as they develop over time, over which we will have absolutely no say. I think it's very hard, I think, to justify that either on a democratic basis or really even looking at the agreements that the EU has reached with other countries in Europe. And um, for example, even the EEA3, Norway and so on, they have, uh, they're subject to the jurisdiction of their own court, the EFTA court and not the Court of Justice on, and, and they have judges on that court. So I, I think there's a trap for Labour and sounding too sympathetic to the EU position on this. Um, it would also be incredibly naive to think that there are no uh, uh, improvements that one could make to the state aid rules. Anyone who actually has to operate them or advise on them knows that they can be pretty obscure in places, pretty complicated and sometimes quite draconian in their effect. There's certainly room for improvement. 
I mean, what I've suggested, and I wrote a piece for Prospect magazine that was published this morning, is that the, um, the, the, it seems to me the only route through this that meets the essential objectives of both sides is for there to be uh, an agreement that effectively protect the, the UK commits to operate an effective anti-subsidy regime to avoid the term state aid to preserve sensibilities, but an anti-subsidy regime that delivers for the EU its objective of being protected against um, unfair subsidies from the UK, against which it finds it will find it quite difficult to retaliate because it, its member states are bound by its state aid rules. Okay. Um, but allows the UK some freedom to um, change some of the aspects of the state aid rules that all of us who practice in that area um, do accept, make them quite difficult to operate. Thank you very much, George. Uh, we'll take a question from Omar and from Kevin before I go to our speakers for responses. Omar. Well, I'm going to be slightly greedy and try to squeeze in two questions <laughs> quickly. <laughs> um, so the first question is about, um, uh, so, so my understanding is that, you know, um, that there's a debate about whether, and this is something that George has uh, informed me on, um, there's a debate about whether after the 1st of July, um, the withdrawal agreement can be amended by, qual by qual uh, QMV or whether ratification of all the members is needed. Um, now, my understanding is that the EU, at least informally, has taken the position that full ratification is needed. Um, but I've, I've kind of um, heard that, that, that there might be some movement on that and that, 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 that this is seen as potentially more open than it was previously. Um, and my second question um, is about the applet body for the WTO, because if we um, either have less, uh, you know, less of a, a role for the Court of Justice or um, you know, uh, more, more international trade treaties which we're dealing with directly rather than through the EU, then the, the applet body uh, is going to have a greater role. Um, and it's obviously in a bit of a crisis at the moment. So I just w wonder if you, if you have thoughts on that. Thank you very much, Omar. Kevin Rogers. Um, basically, uh, uh, basically the, the North Nine thing, the hard border, I'm really worried about that. And I'm disabled as well. As what's going to happen to disabled workers' rights social chapter and workers' right work and time directive and workers' rights would would the would the would the make us harder to keep the job down because the high firing a bit like the US would 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 Boris get rid of the workers' rights would the trade unions and fall fight the defender rights at work. Thank you very, that's great. Thank you, Kevin. So I'm going to take the responses in, in reverse order, starting with Jill. Sorry to pounce on you, Jill. Ah, <laughs> uh, well, um, the first question about whether the withdrawal agreement can be amended. Um, uh, well, it's not clear, but I would say my hunch is that if both parties, if both sides wanted to, we we're talking about to extend the transition period, are we? Um, I think that's, are we talking about if, if we missed the boat to request an extension of the transition period? I think the first the question from George was about the state aid rules and anti-subsidy. Um, oh, the first question. All right, sorry, I don't have anything to contribute on that, I'm afraid. Okay. I'm sorry, I'm talking about Omar's first question. On um, full ratification. Yes, he was talking about whether you can um, amend the withdrawal agreement after the 1st of July, presumably if um, we've missed the boat on asking for an extension of the transition period. I assume that's what Omar was uh, interested in. Um, it's yes, that's right. Sorry, I was, I was I was muted, so I couldn't uh, I couldn't reply. But yes, that's that's uh, exactly what I was thinking about. Yes. Well, I know the, the official view is that you can't, but my hunch is that if both sides want to, then a way will be found. I wouldn't like to spell out what it is, but that's my hunch that a way would be found if they both wanted to. Um, okay, and then what was your, your other question? The appellate body of the WTO. Well, um, no, no, only to echo what you've said yourself, that it's in crisis and um, it's not functioning and uh, we're gonna be in difficulties if we want to rely on that body. Thank you. 
uh, if we, it was Daniel Jones next. Thanks, Catherine. I'm happy to uh, take Omar's question on the WTO appellate body. Uh, you're right, Omar, the appellate body is in, in crisis, and for the benefit of people on the call, that's because the US administration uh, is effectively blocking the appointment of any additional members to the appellate body, the consequence of which is that the body has a sufficient number of members to hear current cases before it, but not to take on uh, any new cases, and therefore that gives any uh, WTO member that has a ruling or finding against it effectively the ability to kick the issue into the long grass by uh, appealing to the appellate body, knowing full well that that case can't be taken on. Uh, are there prospects for uh, that stasis to be uh, resolved? Well, uh, as some people on the call may, may know, the WTO Director General has recently, uh, in the last few weeks, announced that he's standing down, uh, and therefore a new Director General will be appointed. I think the approach that the US will take towards the WTO uh, will depend in large part on who takes over as Director General and whether it's a candidate that the US is or isn't supportive of. It's interesting that lots of people were concerned that the US either would withdraw from the WTO completely or wouldn't participate in the uh, appointment of a new Director General, again, effectively uh, pushing the WTO even further into crisis. So I think in terms of what will happen to the appellate body, that remains to be seen. But it's also interesting to note that the EU and other uh, WTO members, 15 other members in addition to the EU, have effectively taken matters into their own hands and have developed and agreed uh, an interim stopgap measure, i.e. an interim forum uh, for, for the hearing of such disputes as a stopgap until the appellate body issue can be unblocked. So that may give parties some comfort. Thank you very much, Dan. Alfred. Oh, I think we still need to unmute you. Uh, <laughs> Perfect. Okay. Uh, in response to in response to George's point on 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 state aid, yes, I think that would be that would be a good a good place to end up. But I think the problem which the current government is going is is having is not inspiring any confidence that it actually is committed to a level playing field. And having signed up to to, to various things in Northern Ireland Protocol, which we we've seen, then by trying to appearing to resile from them in some of the briefings which have been given, so what Boris Johnson said about tearing up customs forms, doesn't it inspire the EU with any confidence that the government is really going to be committed to maintaining that level playing field. And I, I agree that we, are, we need to understand where, what the EU is concerned about. I don't, I'm, I'm not convinced that there are lots of people in Brussels who want to maintain control of control of what's going on in Britain via, via state aid to some kind of plot. What they don't want is, is Britain being parasitic of the, of, 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 of the EU state aid rules. And if we're going to say, all right, we'll, we won't do anything to hurt you, we'll maintain a level playing field, but can we be allowed to police this ourselves? Then we're going to have to show them that we can be trusted and actually believe in what we're saying we're going to police. And then secondly, in response to Kevin's point, no, there isn't going to be a, a hard border on, on the island of Ireland between Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland. That's what the protocol serves to stop. Rather, the problem, I think, which will be on the unionist side is there is going to be a pretty hard border, certainly for goods entering Northern Ireland from the rest of the UK. Whether the, U whether the rest of the UK wants to allow goods to flow fairly freely back into it at risk of smuggling is another matter. But in order to abide by the protocol, they're going to have to be very substantial checks and duties levied at, our, at Irish ports. Thank you. Thank you very much. Richard Corbett. Thank you. I, I agree with Alfred's um, answer to George. Um, none of us have answered, um, I think, fully Kevin's point on what happens to workplace rights and other social protections. Of course, if the UK is 
now going to adopt its own laws in that field, there is a risk of, of divergence. And indeed, going back to what I said earlier about that actually being one of the political objectives of the neoliberal right of the Tory party, if I can put it that way, to free Britain from these commonly agreed rules and standards. That is precisely what this government may well seek to do in the not too distant future. And certainly are resisting any commitment in these negotiations to keep a similar level of standards. On the question of whether the withdrawal agreements can be modified, either as regards the date so to extend it off if that decision hasn't been taken by June, if you could decide in October, say, to, to extend it, or as regards its content, I would say that even if both sides wanted to politically, that is actually legally very difficult. Um, the withdrawal agreement was an act of under Article 50 of the EU treaty about withdrawal. Once withdrawal has happened, that it's too late to be able to change that act, that uh, withdrawal agreement. You would need a separate agreement of equal status. Now, the status of the withdrawal agreement is its treaty level. So you would need a, uh, you can't just do it by an, a decision of the joint committee, for instance, or of the commission or anybody, or the council or the two government, the governments of the UK and the EU. It would have to be a, uh, an international agreement of treaty status ratified by both sides. Um, that is an extremely tall order because it would involve, um, depending on, if, on what it involves on the content side, so I'll to, to focus on that point, that could well need national ratification as well. If it's simply on the date, even then it, it's, it's quite a tall order. Um, so um, that underlines again the need to have this decision on extension by the end of next month. After that, it is too late and on content equally, if not more, difficult. And finally, slightly related to that, um, can, I, can I agree absolutely with what uh, Jill was saying about the weakness of national parliamentary scrutiny in Britain of international trade agreements? It's absolutely shocking especially, and I see Glyn Ford has just come online, especially for those of us who have served in the European Parliament, where all the trade agreements entered into by the EU have, have a very high level of scrutiny by the European Parliament from the granting of the mandate during the negotiations, and above all, in terms of ratifying or approving them afterwards. It's quite shocking that this doesn't exist in Britain. And can I add one final little point? Northern Ireland, a peculiarity of the, of the situation with post-Brexit is that UK citizens living in, uh, who are Northern Ireland, in Northern Ireland, who are Northern Irish, will have the rights to continue to enjoy the rights of EU citizenship because anybody from Northern Ireland is entitled to a UK passport or an Irish passport or both. And therefore they are all and many of them, even strong unionists, are now getting a second Irish passport, which means they will continue to enjoy the rights of freedom of movement and other rights associated with EU citizenship by virtue of Irish citizenship, which will not be available to residents of the rest of the United Kingdom. Now, that's a rather interesting twist that um, hasn't been highlighted very much in public discourse, um, at least in Britain, maybe in Northern Ireland. We're going to try and squeeze in another round of questions and then we will ask I'll ask for closing submission uh, within your uh, within your answers please so starting with Glenn Ford oh we just need to make sure you're not muted I'm unmuted I think yes yeah uh, yeah very simply uh, is there going to be one trade deal or two I mean all of the recent trade deals that the European Union has done the separated out an EU only section from a mixed section with Singapore, with Vietnam, uh, and the current deals that are being negotiated. The first deal, the EU only deal, requires qualified majority voting in the Council and uh, e European Parliament ratification. That's comparatively simple. The second deal, the mixed deal, requires unanimity in the Council, and as Richard said, uh, something like 32 different parliaments actually ratifying. 
And I think the shortest any of them have done that has been something like four to five years. Uh, and in the interim, at the moment, the European Commission is not giving if you want interim application. Uh, because the feeling is the reaction of certain parliaments would then be to actually vote down the deal. So we're likely to find a partial cliff edge anyway on areas around investment and transport that will create problems for us. The Labour Party's got to decide whether it will also sign up uh, to, if you want, the bilateral deal with the European Union uh, in the absence of a WTO appellate body. And that's going to be an interesting question because, of course, the US has said no. Thank you, Glenn. Stephen Hockman, QC. Um, good evening. Um, four very interesting presentations, um, but I'm left with a lot of anxiety because it seems to me that the outcome of all this is looking pretty bleak. Um, but it seems to me that, um, as George said right at the beginning, there is a trap here for the opposition um, because um, it will be very easy, it seems to me, for the government simply to let this un unfold and unravel and then um, at the end of the year blame the EU for all the adverse consequences and say that that simply proves how right we were um, to leave and I would like to ask what I realize is a very general question which is what in broad terms should the opposition's position be in the coming months um, I don't think we can um, simply say that um, we shouldn't have left the EU that's not really um, uh, 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 an option for us anymore and Keir Starmer has made that perfectly clear. So do we not have to evolve alternative approaches which we say would work better than those adopted by the government? Obviously nothing will work unless it's agreed to by the EU but um, is any work being done to demonstrate that the government is wrong in the way it's handling this and that there are approaches which are different which would work better? Thank you. Finally, we'll go on to, to Veronica Hardstaff. I'm sorry we haven't got to everyone's questions, but um, we are fast running out of time. Uh, yes, in the present situation, we need to take people with us. And I don't think people understand the implications of just dropping out of the EU with no agreement whatsoever. And uh, it would be very useful if we had some sort of figures which on top of the dire situation we're already in because of COVID, um, just what it would cost the economy in terms of tariffs in both directions on our, uh, our economy. And uh, somehow or other, we do need to take the British people with us and have a sufficient number of people putting pressure on the government. And they're under a bit of pressure already uh, to uh, not to actually inflict a lot more hardship on people as a whole. Thank you very much, Veronica. Um, so I'll take it in the order of the, the, the speakers originally. We've got one treaty or two. What should Labour's position be? And tariffs, so a good broad range. Can we start with you, Richard? Yeah, well, Glenn's right to point this out. Um, and... and <laughs> It's a danger, I, and I don't see how you can easily avoid it um, unless the EU um, goes for the provisional application of the uh, of the part that would need national ratification, um, as has been done with CETA, etc. But um, that depends more on EU politics than our own politics. But that that, that would be the way to minimise it. On Stephen's point about the. Labour, Labour position. Yeah, it, it, we can't just go around saying that um, this proves that Brexit was a mistake, though it, it, much of this does prove that Brexit was a mistake, and I don't mind saying it, but I can see why the party as such can't really say that at the moment. But um, it needs to get into this sort of detail and, and opt for the closer forms of relationship that are less damaging. But all this brings us to the central dilemma of Brexit. If you're leaving the EU, either you distance yourself outside the single market, customs union, diverging in your rules, etc., and you have a huge economic hit, or you attenuate that hit, but you align more and more with EU rules over which you no longer have a say because you're not a member anymore. 
it's an unpalatable choice. Neither is actually good for Britain, but if you want to minimize the economic impact, you're better off aligning with rules. After all, most of these are rules that we were perfectly, that we were part of making, that we were perfectly well happy to sign up to. Even the state aid rules, though that George is right, they could be a lot better and they will gradually be reformed. But nonetheless, that is the least economically damaging way to do it. Not an easy choice and nobody, nobody in their right mind would want to be in this position in the first place, but there we are. Thank you, Richard. Alfred. So dealing, dealing with, with Stephen's point about what's actually going to, going to happen going, going forwards and what should happen. Uh, I know George gave evidence to the House of Lords subcommittee on European affairs and they wrote in response to the evidence they had, they wrote to the trade minister and encouraged, encouraged the government to look again at the protocol. But in, in, in terms of renegotiation, how easy that's going to be in terms of rowing back from what's already been signed up to, that's going to be quite hard. What Labour's position should be is on these areas has got to be working out what it really matters fighting for and what actually is worth making a public song and dance about. Because we, it's not going to be beneficial to Labour to be on the front page for dying in a ditch to have Luxembourg court having oversight. However, in terms of protecting substantive workers' rights, that's something which is maybe something that wants to be done more publicly. In terms of these, some of these other areas, which on any view, certainly on the view of the cross-party House of Lords subcommittee, thought some of this is quite worrying. That may be an area where, where Labour Party can actually work cross-party cross with MPs and other parties and try and actually assist the government to understand what it's actually signing up to. Because one day we will be in, we will be in government and we don't want to be bound by state aid rules, and which, we, which we don't like, and the, any more than the current government does. So perhaps if there can be a more collaborative, softly, softly approach on some of these less exciting areas, or not exciting to everyone, even if they are exciting to us, <laughs> and a more showy approach on the other areas, that could be the, that could be the way to mount an effective opposition. Thank you very much. Dan. Thanks, Catherine. Uh, firstly, just briefly taking Veronica's point, I think you're absolutely right that there's more work to be done to uh, amplify what the uh, costs are uh, of no deal, both in terms of the uh, trade relationship with the EU, but also with the third countries that I referred to. Uh, the, the UK government published what's called the UK Global Tariff last week. Uh, so we do now at least have the tools to be able to quantify uh, what that cost would be in the event of a no deal to, to some extent uh, be, between the UK and those third countries. And then lastly, I just wanted to echo uh, the points that Glyn and, and Stephen made, which is that, yes, there are decisions for Labour to take in terms of the positions that it wants to adopt, again, both in terms of the future relationship with the EU, but I would also argue in terms of the trade relationship with the rest of the world. So I think Labour's done a very good job in uh, providing amplification for certain concerns, be they about environmental protections, labor standards, and so on. But is there an opportunity to do more to, to tell a clear and compelling story about what a good or progressive trade policy might look like? If we don't want to simply revert to WTO terms, what are the types of trade agreements that we would want to sign in government? Thank you. Jill. Just, if we can just unmute you. Yes. Um, well, the first question, the technical one from um, Glenn, are we going to have one or two um, agreements with the EU for the future relationship? Well, I think probably in the end, there'll be a lot more than two. I imagine there's going to be a whole package of um, different treaties and even non-treaties. There'll be things in the form of uh, memorandum of understanding as well that are not binding. Uh, which of those would be ready by the end of the transition period, of course, is another matter. Um, and whether there will be one or two ready before that, um, I don't know. But 
Um, and what should the Labour Party's position be? I agree with what Richard said. It's, it's very difficult because, you know, if the Labour Party was in charge, we'd probably end up with something like the single market and the customs union, uh, albeit that, um, you, as you've said, the, we'd be in the unpalatable position of being rule takers, but it's probably the least bad of the options. But to argue for that now, um, it would be branded, of course, as Brino. Um, is not realistic. So we have to argue for um, the greatest amount of cooperation and alignment with the EU as we can in each of the specific spheres. We have to argue why it would be advantageous. And I think publicly, um, we need to explain to the public um, specifically where we feel that UK values are more aligned with Europe's values than with, for example, those of America or other countries that we're negotiating with in areas like human rights, workers' rights, the environment. We need to give examples of that. Um, so, um, so that, in a sense, sort of, un, you know, explains why we're arguing for more cooperation or more alignment, not just for the sake of it, but because it actually expresses British values as who we are. Thank you very much and thank you very much to all of our speakers and people who have contributed and thank you as well to Joe Vinson, our administrator, who does all the behind the scenes tech side of it. Next week we have something a little bit different for you. We have an in conversation with David Lammy MP, our Shadow Lord Chancellor and Secretary of State for Justice. So I hope that many of you will join us again next week. Have a good evening. <laughs>